what's in it. Yeah, yeah, as long as we got the website. Oh, you got music. Oh, yeah, good. We're looking that way, right? I have to look this way, I think. And the camera's there, but we don't look at the camera, right? Hello, Worcester, Central Massachusetts, and the whole world. <coughs> Welcome to another episode of Exposure with Mosier, where we are here to spotlight local entrepreneurs, innovators, and good news in our world. I'm sure we'd all agree we could use a bit more of that. So we have an incredible show today. We have some high-level, what I call, intrapreneurs. So that's an I-N-T-R-A. That's an inside entrepreneur. And you may recognize particularly the woman in the middle, for those of you in Worcester, we have today, among others, we have Superintendent Maureen Benenda um, in the middle. So thank you so much for making it work with your very hectic schedule. Um, to right here, to my right, your left, you have Gary Kaplan, who is from JFY Networks in the Boston area. And last but not least, we have David Driscoll, who some of you may recognize, he is the former Massachusetts Commissioner of Education for our state. So thank you so much for tuning in. We're going to be talking about urban education and innovation and how we can really move our whole nation and world forward, no pressure, I guess, um, with really hearing what they have to say about how we can innovate within the public school system. And we've got some incredible ideas. And I think we did a quick tally, if I'm not mistaken, we have over 140 years of experience here at the table. So uh, without further ado, we'll start with you, Gary, if, I know, give it a chuckle. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. If you could please tell us a bit more about yourself, sure. about your background, your current position, and just briefly <clears throat> what projects you're working on these days. Glad to. Uh, I'm Gary Kaplan. I'm the executive director of JFY Networks in Boston. I've been working with uh, kids, in various capacities for at least 40 years. Uh, jobs uh, for a long time and then education. And for the past five years or so, uh, our organization has been focused on what I now think is the most important step in the whole, uh, the whole uh, pipeline, which is the transition from high school mm -hmm. to college. So we've been focusing on college readiness, uh, which in Massachusetts uh, mainly means being able to pass a series of uh, tests, placement tests, so that kids can get into college and not have to take remedial courses mm -hmm. at college. That's, uh, that's what our focus has been for the past several years, and I, I think that's going to continue. Mm, that's huge. You know, you hear it all the time that it's, young people get so frustrated yes. in these remedial courses and they get stuck, yeah. and that may lead to dropout. Um, exactly, yeah. exactly. Thank you. Uh, anything in particular, Gary, about, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe a, a hobby or an interest that we can get to know you a little bit better as a person? Well, um, I'm very interested in art. Okay. And uh, I actually I get a lot of ideas from looking at paintings and mm -hmm. reading about artists. Uh, I can't exactly say that uh, this project that we've been involved in for the past five years comes directly out of any particular mm -hmm. painter. But I think that uh, the, the general approach of painters to the canvas uh, has definitely influenced my approach to program development. Oh. Well, I'm glad I, I, I asked you I kind of look at it as a, as a painting, a work in progress. A work, aren't we all? <laughs> That's great. And if I recall, Gary, I think yeah. we met initially, it was either 2009 or 2010 when yep. I was with the city working on the STEM grant. That's right. And I think I had come into Boston and we were doing something around green jobs. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, d we were doing job training at that job time. Job training, right. And we shifted because we realized that in, in job training, even though we had a terrific program, you can only do mm -hmm. maybe 100 or 150 people a year. But the issue that we're dealing with, the college, college readiness issue, that's an issue that affects about 9,000 mm. high school graduates a year. Yeah. So to get from 100 or 150 to 9,000 is a pretty long distance. But with online instruction, mm -hmm. the, the, the approach that we're taking now, you can easily do 9,000. Yeah, we're excited to hear more about so you know what yeah. you've done and in other gateway cities and how potentially we could collaborate with you here in Worcester moving forward. Exactly. So thanks, thanks for coming exactly. out, you too, um, sure. David. I know you had a, a bit of a trek involving some traffic, is what I hear. Uh, so thank thank you both for making the trip. Um, so let's. 
hear from Maureen Benenda. If you can tell us a bit more about yourself, your background. I know you are like the token local here, so don't be bashful. I think people know that you are the new superintendent for the Worcester Public Schools. But let us know just briefly again, what are some of the main initiatives or projects and even something interesting people might not know about you already? So this is this, I just started my 41st year working for the Worcester Public wow. Schools. <laughs> I started as a teacher, so I was a teacher. Uh, I've been a department head, uh, assistant principal for 12 years, and I just had finished eight years as principal at South High Community School. I've actually been at South High Community School for 38 years. Um, been very involved in all the activities that you can get involved in as an educator. I was the field hockey coach, the cheerleading coach, sophomore class advisor, um, taught swimming, swim and trim, uh, lifeguard there. So I got the opportunity to work in a school where you can get involved both with the academic parts of students, but also the social and emotional part. And I think a combination of those um, is really important for everyone to get involved in when you're working with students because I think it's in the personalization mm -hmm. of services for students that you have your, your greatest success. I started as superintendent on, on May 24th and um, always we find that in the decisions I've had to make to date that it certainly has been my experience in practice that has been um, the thing that has helped me make the decisions that I've made so far. Uh, the things that we're working on this year, one of our big areas is literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, in the Worcester Public Schools, uh, we have students that come, we're a resettlement city, so we have students that come from many countries, and so we have a lot of challenges with language. And uh, we also, 80% uh, of the students in the Worcester Public School live in poverty, and there's certainly 20% that don't, but there are those challenges uh, for early literacy that we really need to do some really specific work in schools. And so we uh, have a focus of balanced literacy now for our elementary schools and interdisciplinary literacy for our middle and high schools now. Uh, and another area is the career and college readiness. So over you know, the past 10 years, uh, with some of the budget decisions, uh, some of the things that got cut out of the comprehensive high schools were the electives. So students mm. learning about careers or getting specific training in careers was limited. And so now we realize that we need to also build those skills in, in high school. So the other part of my work this year is to expand those college and career. Uh, initiatives for for students. Mm. Uh, another part of our work is um, I, I'm a really big belief in the community and how the school represents the community and the community represents the school. So we really want to um, do very strategic work on branding the Worcester Public Schools so that uh, it's a school of choice for parents to send their students to, that businesses in the community move to Worcester because they move because they know the schools are great, and that's also part of developing the economic conditions of the city. You know, that if you don't have a good school system, then uh, it affects your city. People don't want to move in, mm -hmm. and you don't have the services, so we want to be part of the solution. So when we did our big kickoff this year at the DCU Center, uh, it was the first time ever we have ever done anything like that. Brought together 3,900 employees of Worcester Public Schools together in one place. And our theme was... Cheers. Thank you. That's amazing. And our theme was one school system, one city. And mm -hmm. there's 3,900 employees in the Worcester Public Schools. If every single one of us does our part, mm. just think of the work that we'll be doing mm. for our students in, this, in, this, in wow. the schools and also the connections to mm -hmm. the city. So that's what the kind of the work wow. we're doing. Mm. And Maureen, I do believe you are a product of the Worcester Public Schools I yourself. Am. You want to just say briefly where you grew up and maybe something about your background that people may not know about you? Sure. Um, so I grew up in, in Worcester and um, I w was a student in the Worcester Public Schools and um, one of the one of the groups that I think really made a difference in my life was I was very involved with the girls club. So oh. at an early age, um, I, was a, I was a student that went to the girls club and, uh -huh. you know, I learned to work with, you know, children from all over Worcester. I learned to swim there. Um, swimming is one of my favorite things to do. I'm a swimmer oh. and it started from that. Um, 
And so I, I really believe that there are agencies that can work with schools that can really make a great impact. Definitely. And um, so there is a 100th anniversary of Girls Inc. happening this year, and mm. I've, been, I've been involved with Girls Inc. for 50 years. And wow. it started from just walking from my elementary school every day over to the girls' club and, you know, learning how to... Uh, color, learning how to uh, swim, learning how to play games with other people. And so um, that's probably a fact that not everybody knows. Sure. That some, one of the things that kind of made me who I am today was that I was involved in the yeah. girls' club. And uh, the other part of it is that I think service mm -hmm. is really important and adults mm -hmm. need to do that. So I am a volunteer head usher at Hanover Theater. I will continue oh. to do that. Um, I, and it's, it's interesting because people will see my sign on me and stop and say, you're the superintendent of schools, why are you here? <laughs> and my response to them is, as an adult, we have an obligation to volunteer to our community, and that's why I'm here. And then they'll say, wow, maybe I should volunteer too. So I think, you know, when you're in the community, your, your face and your voice always has to be about we all need to make steps to help our community. So those are two things that probably wow. people don't know about me. Well, you heard it here first on the Exposure <laughs> with Closure show. So thank you, our yeah. superintendent. Thank you. And yeah. congratulations thank on your you. new position. And I can say, and I'm sure I am reflecting the views of many in our great city, that we are so fortunate to have you in this thank position. You. Really you. getting it from, you know, your really your whole life and 41 mm -hmm. years um, working in the school system alone, not to mention what we just heard about your background. That's really mm -hmm. impressive. Um, and I think... Maureen, I think we met probably for the first mm -hmm. time back in either 05 or 06 yes. when I was at the Boys and Girls Club working at the teen room. Yes. And your amazing students from South High were going to the different nonprofit sites mm -hmm. and they were evaluating sites to see if the funding that those students approved mm -hmm. was working out. Yes. And um, I think that's when we first met. And I remember a big bus of South High yes. students getting off in front of the old club actually yes. the old club we since Ionic moved yeah. exactly um, and and then more recently we had worked together with youth philanthropy mm -hmm. work um, I know that's another amazing thing that could be its own show by itself how youth philanthropy training and training young people as grant makers yes. so no matter what their background or circumstance they're actually given the opportunity to decide as a diverse group how to allocate certain funds to nonprofit organizations doing great work in the community and that is life-changing. I think that's one of many potential programs that could be scaled up, um, not only system-wide, but I don't know, nationwide. So those some thoughts. Um, so not? thanks again. Thank you. Great. So let's hear from David Driscoll. Um, so please tell us a bit more about yourself. Um, you've trekked all the way here to the heart of the Commonwealth here today. Um, I don't know how much you are former work as Commissioner of Education for the state brought you to the WU, uh, Worcester. But please tell us a bit more about yourself, your background, and what you're up to now. Well, I'd like to think that I, uh, <laughs> uh, I got around the state about as well as any commissioner and, and came to Worcester yeah, often yes. uh, and visited schools, including yes. Maureen's. Uh, before I talk about myself, I, I, I just have to reflect sure. back to Maureen and, and congratulate Worcester on, on, on uh, its, sele uh, its selection of Maureen. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the research talks about two kinds of superintendents and commissioners, for that matter, place-bound and career-bound. And, mm -hmm. and the theory is that place-bound people come up through the system as Maureen did, and career-bound are the ones that, you know, these experts that come in from outside. And most people think that the career-bound superintendents or commissioners are likely to be the ones that are most innovative because they're coming from other places and so forth. And I think Maureen's a perfect example mm. of how that's not true. And I think Bob Antonucci and I mm. proved that mm -hmm. as commissioners. We both came up through the system mm -hmm. from teacher up to commissioner. And uh, if people haven't noticed, we still lead the country. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and we started in 2003. So I, uh, I have, uh, I contributed a lot to this 140 years. Uh, <laughs> it was September of, uh, Two years ago, September of 2014, that was would, would mark my 50th year anniversary uh, wow. being a junior high school math teacher in Somerville at the huh. Western Junior High School, which is no longer there. It's, Tufts has it now. Uh, and I went on to be a high school math teacher and then an assistant superintendent, superintendent, deputy commissioner, and then commissioner of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at the time that we implemented the law. And uh, 
So since that time, I've uh, been doing a number of things. I'm on boards, uh, I do some consulting, and uh, I play golf. <laughs> All right. Very nice. And Maureen, I, I have to say it, because in our prep session, yes. we both sort of had a moment where we're mini golfers. So yes. uh, <laughs> I myself, you guys were throwing out some different golf analogies, yes. and I'm like, oh, gosh, I don't know what that means. But mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. And it does. It, it helps the people that are, are watching, you know, to say, oh, you know, we're all humans, no yes. matter what position we hold now or previously mm -hmm. held. Um, you know, it's really cool to share our hobbies and interests. So thank you guys all very much for opening up the show that way. Hmm. Um, I would love to know a little bit more about what you each feel are the most pressing issues facing public education today. So we all know we have the general elections upon us. I feel strongly myself that urban ed is really a vital part of the agenda for the nation. That's my own thought. So um, what are your thoughts on what aspects of urban ed do you feel are most of a priority, and what do you really have your eye on moving forward? Maureen, would you like to start us sure, off? Sure, sure. So, well, there, one thing I think about urban ed is, and I say this, you know, I said this when I was principal, and I addressed it and said it to um, the staff now superintendent, is that education is the one thing that's going to change students' lives. That, that that's it for many students, you know, not only in urban ed, but in particularly urban mm -hmm. ed. Because they come to schools with different skills, and the only way you're going to get them to get the skills that they need and to be able to compete is through education. Uh, and in urban ed, you have some, you know, certain challenges, like you could have students that have more poverty. Um, you definitely have students, uh, like in Worcester, that have a very large ELL, English language learners, population. So they come to, to Worcester and they, they, they don't really know English. Yet, that doesn't mean they're, they're not as bright and as smart as everywhere else. It just means that you have to have, you have to know the tools in order to teach them English so that they can learn. And that can be done through curriculum, but also very mm -hmm. specific strategies to work with them so that they're able to learn the English. So uh, the other part of it is you have to wrap services around kids. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I was at South High for, for those 38 years, you know, at one particular day we were talking about hunger and we decided to do a whole week on hunger because we felt as though kids were embarrassed to tell us that they were hungry because and that's a socioeconomic mm -hmm. situation it's not because of them it's not their fault so we do a hunger week which we still do where every single day we talk about uh, like, like say on Monday it was English day and we read all the books and poems about hunger on Tuesday in math we talked we used all the statistics about hunger in Worcester in the state in the country in the world in real math problems mm -hmm. on Wednesday we talk about the sociological part the history of that on Thursday we brought all the doctors in from UMass Medical School and they went to all the science class and they talked about the biological effect of it mm. on that Friday after those four days kids started trickling to my office and said miss I'm hungry mm. we have no food we cannot make it through the weekend in the end of the month we have no food at all can you help and so we kind of removed those barriers. Mm -hmm. And so we started the first food pantry uh, in the high school in Worcester. Mm -hmm. And that food pantry is still run. And now there are several other food pantries that have come up for students. But it had, had it not been that we took the barrier down, we probably mm -hmm. knew there was hunger, but we didn't know the extent of it. Mm -hmm. And then it's our responsibility to take that barrier away. So. My idea has always been take the barriers away so there no, are no excuses. Mm -hmm. so, so you take care, there's a food pantry there. You make sure that they have free breakfast, lunch, right? The other part of it is clothing. Teenagers don't come to school mm -hmm. or sometimes elementary if they don't have clean clothing. But if you don't have clean clothing, it's because you couldn't afford to have it washed. So we have a food clothing. I mean, a, a clothing pantry now. Um, our, a lot of our refugees, for example, um, teeth and eyes when they're refugee camps, those are two areas that really uh, mm -hmm. aren't taken care of. So now we have a partnership with Mass School of Pharmacy, free eye exams, free glasses. Now we're working on the dental part. So you take all that away and you say to kids, okay, you have one job. Your job's to learn. Mm -hmm. we're, we're taking care of those barriers for you. So in urban ed, that's what you have to do. You take care of the barriers mm -hmm. that are stopping kids from achieving. 
and you provide the extra support. You have excellent trained staff, mm -hmm. and you make those community connections that you need to support the family. So those are the areas. So along that line, some of it does cost money, and the foundation budget mm -hmm. for urban schools need to be looked at because the formula isn't right. You definitely need more support. And actually, it hasn't been changed since 1993, Wow, the formula. So it really does need to be looked at. Wow. So that would be... Thank you. What I would say. So I'm going to move to Gary because I know mm -hmm. in our preparation um, mm -hmm. you have identified that among other challenges and priorities mm -hmm. in public schools, mm -hmm. this idea around how do we reduce the amount of kids going into remedial mm -hmm. courses and mm -hmm. therefore increase the overall graduation rates, yeah. um, you know, which hopefully you know, would impact high schools but also community colleges and other public colleges. So mm -hmm. can you focus mm -hmm. in on that particular priority and tell us a little bit more about how we might address the skills gap? I'm glad to. Um, let me just uh, begin where the superintendent left off. Uh, it, we all know, and uh, you know better than most, uh, how huge uh, many of the issues are that face urban, urban education. And uh, uh, I would like to um, uh, confirm what you said, uh, urban education is the most important institution we have in this country. That's where the future is either uh, going to happen or it's going to happen in a way that we don't want. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this, is, this is where the future is being formed right now. Um, what it comes down to from, a, uh, from a, uh, an economic competitiveness point of view, uh, we have to have a skilled workforce. Mm -hmm. We are never going to have an economy that's going to support a lot of unskilled jobs again. That is over. That ended sometime in the 1970s or so. Uh, the United States is now a high skill economy. People who do not have high skills are not going to be able to find employment that's going to support them and a family. That's just the way it is and you can uh, you can bemoan the loss of the old uh, steel industry, but it's not coming back. So we have to figure out how to get more of our population th through some kind of post-secondary education. It doesn't all have to be a bachelor's degree. It can be a technical certificate. It can be a two-year degree. Mm -hmm. But some level of post-secondary education is now just necessary. Unfortunately, in the United States, We've only got about 40% of our total population, adult population, that have a, uh, a, a college degree. Massachusetts is doing better than most of the country. We're at about 54%. All of the urban areas, including Worcester, are maybe around 20 to 25%. So it's, uh, it's clear that the areas, the, 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 the sections of the country where we need to focus mm -hmm. on college readiness, those areas are the cities. What we do, uh, and uh, I discovered uh, as we were walking over here today that uh, the superintendent and we are on exactly the same page here. We come into high schools. The issue is getting kids from high school into college. Exactly. And as kids leave high school and they go especially into community college, about 70% of the kids coming into community college don't have the skills, the reading and math skills, to meet the entry requirements of the community college. That means they get placed in remedial courses. It can be one course, it can be five courses, but as soon as a, a student is placed in a remedial course at the community college level, that student's chances of graduating are 10%. Mm. We are losing 6,000 students every year to remedial courses at the community colleges. That is a loss of manpower that we, that we simply right. have to stop. So what we do is go into, into high schools and we administer the same placement tests that the colleges use. And tell us again the name of the test. Just so uh, the test in there. Massachusetts and uh, actually most states is called the AccuPlacer. Mm -hmm. It's a college board product. It's uh, kind of similar to the SAT, but it's a, a different test. So we administer the AccuPlacer. We see what the issues mm -hmm. are. We put the student into an online curriculum that addresses exactly what the test just pointed out. And then when we're through with the instruction, we give the test again at the end. About 50 to 60 percent of the remedial courses that students would have had to take mm -hmm. are now eliminated because we've passed the test. And then those scores go directly to the college. Um, what it amounts to is three points that the superintendent uh, 
uh, also practices uh, focused, in, focused instruction, mm -hmm. extra support, and absolutely no excuses mm. for not making the grade. And that's, that's what we've been doing for the past five years in Massachusetts and in a couple of other right. cities too. I would, I would encourage people to check out the JFY Network's website um, that's online. You can get a lot more information. So I want to, if you can believe it guys, we're getting toward the end of the show. So I want to um, wrap things up with the former Commissioner of Education, David Driscoll. Um, so if I can ask you, David, now that you've been working more on the national level since leaving your position as Commissioner here in Massachusetts, where do you see public education heading, particularly with the new ESSA law? And break that down if you could. And how would that affect Massachusetts? Well, it follows exactly with mm -hmm. this previous discussion about urban education. So if you look at it nationally, there's a million kids approximately in the New York public schools, city schools. Mm -hmm. More kids than in all of Massachusetts. There's a million kids, give or take, in Los Angeles. So. Wow. Where are we going? I mean, we're not going anywhere unless we figure out how to address the needs mm -hmm. of the kids in our urban areas. Here in exactly. Massachusetts, obviously, Boston, Worcester, Springfield, and then the number of gateway cities, Lawrence, Lowell, New Bedford, et cetera. And, and you know, it is time to revisit the foundation. But after all, the foundation mm -hmm. budget was supposed to bring everyone up to uh, a, a, at least a shot at uh, the minimum of a, a playing field, and that's not happening mm -hmm. you know, when you can't provide certain services. Uh, nationally, what's happened is the No Child Left Behind uh, NCLB era uh, became viewed by the public, uh, schools themselves, and, and uh, Congress, more importantly, uh, as, as too dominated by the federal government. So a new law has finally been passed at the federal level called ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea of it. We've got to make sure every student succeeds. And when we talk about every student, we are really talking mm -hmm. predominantly about urban kids, mm -hmm. if you think about it. I mean, that's, that's the great numbers. Gary mentioned uh, percentage of high school, uh, college graduates we have here in Massachusetts, but that number is in danger of going down just because of age. Uh -huh. The number of uh, people in, in uh, Massachusetts that have college degrees are retiring at faster numbers than we are replacing them. Mm -hmm. And this gap between uh, those kids that aren't able to go to college without remediation uh, and those kids that right now are being held, that gap would fill mm -hmm. the difference. So that's why how crucial it is that we get these young people coming out of our urban centers qualified, to meet the skills so that they can, and these, there are jobs available for right. them. So basically the new ESSA gives authority back to states and districts Great. and takes it away from the federal government. And David, what's that new forthcoming book people should look out for? So I am writing a book. Uh, I, I haven't got a title yet, That's but okay. it is approved by the Harvard Education Press, so hopefully it'll be on the streets next How exciting. summer. Okay, well, you've got everybody's emails here, please. No person is too big to email. You shoot them an email, you follow up with them, and let's all stay connected, support one another, in particular, see what we can do to come together and support urban education for all children. Thank you so much for tuning in, and thank you all for thank being you. here. Thank Great. you, Amy.